So I'm going to talk about surveillance today. Um, and I'm taking mostly a U.S. perspective for a couple of reasons. Uh, the most obvious one is that's what I know best, but the other is because it has a very strong impact on the rest of the world. And the third is, for a variety of reasons, it's also the one that we can study best. U.S. laws about surveillance and U.S. policy about surveillance is much more public than other nations' surveillance laws and regulations. And then, as a result of the Snowden uh, revelations, we know somewhat more about U.S. surveillance than we do about other nations. So I'm talking about here surveillance in the internet age, and that means that I am going to talk about, uh, so there, there's many types of surveillance in the internet age. There's wiretapping, there's look, collecting communications metadata, that is the, um, the information about where communications are traveling, be between what parties the communications are traveling, at what time, what the duration is, and so on. Um, there's cloud data, there's other types of transactional data, for example, the transactional data that records um, where automobiles are, uh, the transactional data from, your, uh, from the subway passes that you might use. There's uh, other types of, uh, personal, of, of, of data available now. Ten years ago, fifteen years ago, it was unusual for faces to be, face pictures to be collected because facial recognition wasn't very good. Facial recognition is a great deal better and faces are being picked up in all sorts of places. Similarly, uh, automated license plate readers are now quite common. But I'm going to focus here only on the first two. I'm going to mention that cloud data exists, and cloud data exists is important because often when you hear about it's hard to get data off a phone, it's hard to get data in certain places, often the data is replicated in the cloud. Or other data that is useful is in the cloud. But I'm not going to focus on the cloud, I'm going to focus on the first two, on, on wiretapping communications and on uh, communications metadata. I'm also going to talk about getting data off devices. So wiretapping is as old as electronic communications. Um, in the United States, we know of cases during the Civil War, which was in the 1860s, in which um, wiretappers traveled to find out, to tap the telegraph wires to find out what the enemy was doing and then report back to their forces. Wiretapping didn't become popular as a form of criminal investigation, at least in the United States, until the 1920s. And that was because the type of crime didn't make it particularly valuable. In the 1920s, we had a law called Prohibition, which made the selling of alcohol, the manufacturing and selling of alcohol, illegal. And many people wanted to drink, so there were people manufacturing, purchasing, and, and, and selling alcohol. And this involved conspiracies in order to, to actually make this happen. Once you have conspiracies, wiretapping is a particularly useful tool because, of course, then you can find out what people are saying, what people are plotting. So wiretapping became a tool of choice for, for law enforcement in the 1920s and became regulated in the United States by law in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, telegraph and radio are were valuable immediately for intelligence purposes. The telephone was the, what, what law enforcement was more interested in, less interested in radio and, and telegraph because of who was, who was doing the communicating. Armies communicate by telegraph and radio, um, criminals communicate by phone. That's a gross generalization, but in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, that was all generally correct. There's blurring now of that. Let me tell you very, very briefly about wiretap law in the United States. Not because, again, U.S. wiretap law is so important internationally, but because it's a framework on which you can think about your own nation's laws. <coughs> Excuse me. So in 1968, the U.S. passed Title III, uh, uh, Crime Control and Safe Streets Act, Title III of which controlled wiretapping for criminal investigations. It required that a serious crime be, be, be being committed, that is, law enforcement had to go to the court and say, we have evidence that there's a serious crime, and that the communications, we, we have probable cause that there's a serious crime. There's a list of crimes for which wiretaps can be used, um, and the crime had to be one of that list. At the time, it was 25 crimes. Now it's close to 100. Um, the, uh, phone had to be used in the commission of the crime and there had to be few other alternatives 
for uh, getting the evidence. That is to say, the wiretap needed to be essentially a last resort. Now, why were there such restrictions on wiretaps? It's a very invasive search. In the United States, we have a law, we have a, an amendment that, that we have a, a whole set of amendments that protect people against the power of the government. You know, every, every nation has its own philosophy about the role of government in citizens' lives. The United States was originated where it believed, the, the, the way the government was formed, it tried to restrict interference of the government in people's lives. And the Fourth Amendment says, no warrant shall issue but upon due cause, and any warrant shall specifically describe the places, peoples, and effects to be searched. Now, a wiretap is a general, so normally in the United States when police investigate, if they show up at a house, they say, here's the search warrant that a judge has signed that says, we have probable cause to believe there's evidence here of a crime, blah, blah, blah. But with a wiretap, you don't do that, because of course, if you say to somebody, we're gonna wiretap your phone, nobody would speak on the phone and say anything criminal. So you only, in, tell people they've been wiretapped sometime after the wiretap is over. That's for criminal investigations. Intelligence investigations are different. But as a result, because you're doing a search without first informing the, the people whom you're searching, it's considered an extremely invasive type of search. And so in US law, a wiretap is a, is a much harder warrant to get than normal types of, of warrants. We also have a foreign intelligence surveillance uh, tap that you need probable cause that you need you need evidence that the person you're tapping is in the service of a foreign power and more recently or is participating in a terrorist organization it can be a small terrorist organization it can be a terrorist organization of size one now that one might imagine could have political implications. How do you know that somebody is a, in a terrorist organization of size one? Are you investigating people who in fact aren't doing anything wrong, they're just using freedom of speech? The last time I, I heard about it, which was a, a couple of years ago, no one had been investigated under a FISA warrant within the United States under what we call the lone wolf provision, that is one, a single person uh, planning terrorist activities. Okay, so that hadn't been abused. Now, let me explain just a little bit more about the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or let me call it FISA, which is the way we normally call it. Um, FISA governs wiretapping within the United States and the wiretapping of an American outside the United States. It has nothing to say about wiretapping anybody else outside the United States. And that's not surprising. Intelligence services conduct investigations outside their countries, and very rarely are there any rights acceded to the people outside their countries. Laws protect typically the people inside the country, not the people outside. Okay, so this FISA, FISA is only a law impacting essentially wiretapping of Americans, in, uh, well, of anybody inside the United States and of Americans outside. There's also something called the United States Signals Intelligence uh, uh, Signals Intelligence Directive 18. That's the rules that um, the intelligence agencies have to follow when they, when they conduct such surveillance. Uh, part of that is actually public. You can actually Google UCID 18 and you can see some of the rules. And so that's, when I say that the United States is much more public about its intelligence collection than the rest of the world, it's the fact that UCID 18 is public, the fact that FISA is public and so on. Many nations don't have that. Um, I already pointed out there are different rules for collecting on citizens versus non-citizens. Although within the United States, if, if government is collecting, it is typically, uh, you need a warrant in, in, in virtually every case. So, wiretapping. This is the phone that sits in my study. It's a reminder of the old world. Uh, it doesn't move, well it can move, but it weighs three pounds and when you dial it's a slow process. The interesting part about it um, is when the phone was developed, every time a call goes through a switch, the voice on the call, if you're doing uh, analog switching, the voice on the call, the quality of the voice drops. So the telephone company didn't want more than five switches on any call, you know, from me to Jordan, from, from, uh, from me to Montreal, from me to the next block. It shouldn't have more than five switches. What that creates then is a centralized architecture, okay? 
That's an important thing. So if you're going to wiretap, um, it's pretty easy because from my house, there will be a wire, or in the case of a cell phone, a wireless signal. But from my house, there will be a wire to what's called the phone central office. If government is going to wiretap, they put the wiretap on there. Okay? And there are only five switches in between, at most. Um, wireless made it a little bit more complicated because wireless, the phone roams. Now, the way the technology works when the phone roams, if, if the call is incoming, if, if you're dialing, um, I'll call it an area code because that's what we call it in the United States. I don't know what people call it in the rest of the world. But the, the first few digits that say what part of the country that number belongs to, um, and then there's the first few parts of the phone number, the call will originally go to the home register. If I'm roaming, my phone has told the home register I'm somewhere else. The home register sends the call on to the tower near where I am. At that point, um, I have a wiretap. There's a wiretap on my call at the home register, and so my tap phone is tapped. You guys with me so far? First time I make a call from a, my roaming phone, it goes from my roaming phone to the nearest cell tower and then to my home district where there's a check on whether or not I, I have enough money to pay for the call, whether, you know, whether I have an active phone and all of that. If it comes to my home register, that says they also check, you know, is there a wiretap? And if there's a wiretap order, then the phone is tapped. Every other time I make an, and, and that, that business then, um, Every other time I make a call when I'm roaming, it doesn't go to the home register. So it becomes a slightly more complicated process to wiretap a, a cell phone than an, a, a wireline phone. It's not an impossible process. It's just slightly more complicated technically. Because what you don't want to have is a delay factor that lets the user know, hey, something funny is happening. My phone is tapped. The whole point is that each of these are centralized communications. The architecture of saying there's a degradation in analog voice every time it goes through a switch forces a centralized architecture. And this is one of the things when you work in surveillance and surveillance policy, it's really important to think both about the social, the political, legal, but also about what's the technical architecture, what's get, what's get for, what gets forced by the technical architecture. Um, I want to skip this. For, I want to go to this, and then I'll go back. Well, maybe I'll do it this way. OK. Um, I told you about Title III and, and, and FISA. 1994, the United States government, or the FBI, got very worried about cell phones and digital phones. They saw that the phones were switching. And they were switching from analog voice, with less requirement for centralization, to digital voice. And they were worried about being able to wiretap. And they required that all digitally switched telephone systems have wiretap capability built into the switch. Hold on to that for a while. It's important. So that's the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, or CALEA. Um, the Europeans came up with a similar set of standards, the Etsy standards. Now we'll go back to technology. We get Facebook. And Facebook, of course, is an, IP, is a, is an internet service. But it's a centralized service. And that makes it really easy to wiretap. In particular, Facebook provides its services by knowing what the user is saying. Okay, Everything at Facebook is in the clear. I'm lying a little because, of course, Facebook encrypts stuff so that nobody wiretaps Facebook, breaks into Facebook. But when it's providing services, it, it, uh, it sees things in the clear. And that makes it easy to do a wiretap at Facebook, easy from a technical sense. You still need, within the United States, a, a, a wiretap warrant. Now you go to Skype, and I'm talking about Skype of 10 years ago, which was a peer-to-peer -peer service. And a peer-to-peer -peer service is much harder to wiretap. And the reason is this wonderful picture of Alice and Bob. Am I allowed to step back? Can, can you still see me? You're fine. I'm fine. So we have over here Bob at a coffee house. Alice is at an airport lounge. Alice wants to talk to Bob via VoIP, and it's on a peer-to-peer -peer VoIP system. So at the airport lounge, she's got Fly ISP. That's the, the ISP at the lounge. She asks to speak to Bob, who's, who's, who uses the, um, 
the ISP, SIPS ISP. So his address is Bob at SIPS ISP. Well, Fly ISP says, okay, what's Alice's, uh, sorry, Bob's uh, IP, uh, his, his uh, I said this incorrectly. His VoIP provider is Packet Talk, the cloud all the way on the left on the top. Alice says, I want to talk to Bob at Packet Talk. Fly ISP says, OK, Alice's VoIP name is Alice at IP Voice. And she wants to talk to Bob at Packet Talk. Bob at Packet Talk says, is Bob online? Yeah, he's at SIPS ISP at the coffee house. At that point, Packet Talk gives IP Voice Bob's current IP address. And then Bob and Alice talk. And they talk through somewhere in the cloud. They're out here on the bottom picture. The point is, where is the wiretap order? The wiretap order is up at the top. If Alice has the wiretap order, the wiretap order is at IP voice. IP voice is not going to tell Fly ISP, the ISP that Alice is using at the moment, that Alice has a wiretap order on her. The reason for that is that they don't know anything about Fly ISP. Maybe Fly ISP works for organized crime. You can't just do it in real time. So doing a, a wiretap on peer-to-peer -peer mobile communications is hard, hard technically. Okay. A long conversation between Alice and Bob, a 20-minute conversation, a half-hour conversation, a two-hour conversation, law enforcement can do it. But a short conversation, no. Where do you tap? Do you tap on the device, at the switch, on the cloud? On the device, which operating system is the device using? Which version of the operating system is the device using? All of these things matter. Which app is the, is the, is the user using? If the, if the user is just using plain old voice on the phone, that's one thing. But if the user is using signal, which is encrypted end to end, it becomes a different problem. And which version of the app? So before we think more about wiretapping, we want to ask how effective it is. And again, I'm going to bring out numbers from the United States. Part of the reason for that is the United States is, again, very visible on what it does. So when the United States passed the law on wiretapping back in 1968, there was a requirement that all criminal wiretaps, be, be, whether done by the federal government or the state governments, have to be reported in a public fashion. Once a year, there's something called the wiretap report put out by the administrative office of the US courts. It reports on every single wiretap done for a criminal investigation in the United States. And from that, you can find out all sorts of data. Um, <coughs> law enforcement talks about the need to go after kidnappers, child pornographers, and gangs and drug dealers. What you find out is that the reality is there were 10 investigations for arson, weapons, and, ex and explosives, one for bribery. The vast majority were narcotics. I'm not trying to argue that wiretapping isn't used against bad guys. But I am saying that the rhetoric of what wiretap is claimed to be used for and the reality are somewhat different. How effective is wiretapping? It depends on the type of case. So let me tell you now about a case that happened in the United States um, ten, uh, six, eight years ago. Um, it, it unfolded in, the, in 2009, 2010. New York Times reported in September 2009 that a young man driving from Colorado to uh, New York had been stopped as he came over the bridge into Manhattan. Um, his car was searched. Then his car was searched again uh, when he was in uh, Queens or Brooklyn, and he was arrested. Seemed pretty weird. There were a couple more reports like that. And then things went silent. And then six months later, he, was, he pleaded guilty to a terrorism case. And he, he's in jail, probably for life is my guess. I don't remember. Um, what had happened is that under the rules of, uh, under one of the wiretap rules, the FBI had information that somebody in a motel in Colorado was communicating with a number in Pakistan that was suspect. And they listened into the, they, they observed the communications, and they discovered somebody who sounded increasingly agitated over the course of an evening. They went in and looked at the motel room, investigating. They found trace chemicals on the stove that were the makings of a bomb. Now, this was the second time this young man had rented the motel room. 
They only investigated the second time because they only picked it up the second time. They had been handed the communication, the endpoint in Pakistan from the British, and they were allowed to wiretap within the United States because of uh, Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act, more technical than you need to know. Um, it turned out that this young man was planning to, uh, to do subway bombs on several subways in New York. And they gathered evidence against him. Um, they found Google searches um, of, of where to buy uh, hydrogen peroxide. They found that he had bought a lot before he left Colorado, that he was trying to do the same in New York. They had sufficient evidence that, that he pleaded guilty, and, and as did his co-conspirators. But the point was that the way they got him was that first initial bit, he was in communication with a suspect number abroad. They listened to the communication. There was enough information in the communication to allow them to get a warrant to search the motel room. The motel room gave them enough evidence to then search him and, and so on. So the point is that sometimes wiretapping can be devastatingly effective. Um, an important side effect of wiretapping is that it keeps the bad guys off of communication systems. Back in the 1990s, organized crime in the United States was so nervous about wire being wiretapped that they didn't use the phones. Well, if you can make organized crime or terrorists or any sort of bad guys less efficient, that's great. Doesn't mean wiretapping isn't working. It's just working in a day way different from the way you ant originally anticipated. Let's talk a little bit about transactional information, the metadata of communications. So Khalid Sheikh Mohammed um, was using a phone that he was one of the masterminds of the uh, September uh, 2001 attacks against the United States. He was, in fact, the mastermind. The US tracked him through the use of his phone number in Keta and, 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 and arrested him. The 721 bombers from uh, 2005 in, I think it's 2005, in the UK, or 2005 or 2007, sorry, I'm losing it, um, in the UK. Um, three of them were, tra these were th four young men who tried to blow up uh, three underground cars and one uh, bus in, um, in the UK, in London. <coughs> three of them were arrested fairly quickly. Uh, they were identified by people who they were, and they were picked up because their pictures were circulated. The fourth one borrowed his brother-in-law's phone and went down to Rome. Uh, the police went to his brother's apartment in Rome because that was where the phone was seen in the vicinity. The phone was tracked through France, through Italy, and, he was, and they went to the brother's apartment and found him there. Um, uh, in the United States, when a criminal is on parole and violates parole that has been, been released from jail but then doesn't do whatever they're supposed to do, the U.S. Marshals Service investigates when it's a federal crime that the person was imprisoned for. The time to find somebody who's violating parole went from 44 days, the average time, to two. Because what do you do? You look at where that cell phone is at 11 o'clock at night. You look at where that cell phone is at 6 in the morning. And then you see who of that person's friends and acquaintances are in that region, and the next morning you go up at 5 in the morning to arrest them. It solved the Rafiq Harari assassination case. So Harari was a former prime minister of Lebanon. Um, it looked like he would come back into power. He was uh, driving in an entourage, a protected motorcade. A truck bomb came and killed him. Um, and there was they couldn't figure out anything except that the video of the person who claimed to do it did not match the DNA of the bomber. Okay, the person who was who claimed on the video to have done it, they couldn't find any evidence at the site that that was the bomber. They had evidence it was somebody else. Over a period of time, they um, an investigator in Lebanon began tracking sets of phones and found very interesting sets of phones. He labeled them red, yellow, blue, green. And he found that they were tracking Harari in, in very interesting ways. And each group communicated within itself. And then one phone from each group communicated to the other colors, and that was it. 
But, and, and they tracked Harari for a number of days. They timed how long it would take. There was, when Harari on the day of the assassination stopped to have coffee somewhere, there was a communication from somebody who was tailing him to the group that actually was in charge of the bomb. That group stopped and waited till Harari left the coffee house and then started up again. Um, and from the evidence from the phone, they know who did it. Okay. That was 2005. People have become more clever since then. But it's, if you want to understand how metadata is used in investigations, that's a, a really excellent case to study. There's an article in the New York Times Magazine called The Hezbollah Conne Connection that describes it. It's revelatory in lots of ways. Three researchers at Stanford asked people to voluntarily give the metadata of their telephone communications for the researchers to study. And they got contributions from about 550 people. Um, uh, they had 33,000 phone calls that they analyzed. Um, they discovered 57% of the phone calls went to health services, 40% to financial services, 30 to pharmacies, 10 to legal services. Look at those numbers. Those are things that people think of as sensitive communications. When they're calling a pharmacy, when they're calling a, a lawyer, when they're calling health service. There's <coughs> a lot that you reveal that way. The researchers were able to actually find out a great deal more. They noticed that somebody communicated with a local neurology group, a neurology head, uh, a specialty pharmacy, and a hotline for a drug used only to, to deal with multiple sclerosis. You know what happened to that person without having learned, without having heard any of the communication. Same thing when somebody talked to a cardiologist, a medical lab, got a call from a pharmacy, and then called a hotline for a device dealing with arrhythmia. There were several other cases where they could profile that somebody was going for an abortion, that, that somebody was thinking of, of, getting, um, of growing marijuana at home, and so on. So when the Snowden disclosures happened, one of the things that came out was that the United States was doing bulk collection against American citizens. It was doing domestic bulk collection. I participated in a National Academy study on that, um, on bulk collection, and we looked at what bulk collection provides. Of course, the most interesting thing is it provides information about the past. If you're doing a law enforcement or national security investigation and suddenly someone becomes of interest, you don't know anything about them before. You can try to find out stuff before. You can try to look at their bank records and so on. But you don't have a really full history. On the other hand, if you have bulk collection, you can then go backwards in time. Without bulk collection, you don't have that possibility. It also provides contact chaining. This is, for example, two groups of Somali pirates. If you look at the groups in separately, you say person A in the middle of that, or the group on the left, and person B in the middle of the group on the right are the more interesting people. But if you look, if you have all the data, you suddenly see that the connectors are the people that are important. And whether it's drug investigations in the United States or Paul Revere, who was the person who told the people in Massachusetts that the British were invading and which way they were invading, turns out Paul Revere was the connector between a whole group a whole four or five different groups of, of people who were fighting the British. Being a connector is a really important thing. So contact chaining is very useful when you're doing investigations. Bulk connection, as I said, gives information about the past, tactical intelligence, strategic intelligence, and then it gives something called reference data. If you're doing intelligence, if you're a government doing intelligence, if you're doing law enforcement within your own country, you can get telephone books and bank records and hotel uh, information and so on. But if you're conducting intelligence against another country because somebody in that other country is suspicious or maybe you don't trust the government or whatever, you don't get the telephone books and the hotel records and so on. But the bulk communications data provides some of that information, that background information for you. Um, <coughs> the Snowden disclosures were the bulk connection, bulk collection of metadata was happening, warrantless collection of content if one end was outside the United States. Um, so let me say one small thing about that. There had always been warrantless collection if one end was outside the United States. When FISA was passed, it said 
that if, some, if there's a radio communication where one end goes outside the United States, no warrant is needed to collect within the United States. So if, for example, somebody was communicating with the Russians from Maryland, Ru the Russians and maybe the Russian embassy, the Russian embassies within the United States, or maybe they were com communicating with somebody who was in the United States but not at the embassy because the embassy actually counts as part of Russia, but they were communicating with somebody in the U.S. and also with somebody outside the U.S. That's kind of like them being outside the U.S. And so there was an exemption. But everything moved to fiber optic cable by by the time of the Snowden disclosures. And so the NSA had argued, well, it moved to fiber optic cable. We're not really changing things. Not everybody saw it that way. Um, this map explains the value of that collection. So you know part of the value, because you know the business that of the, all the data centers in the United States. What you might not know is all the cables that go into the United States. So for example, if you want to make a call from Bolivia to Brazil, it's a fiber optic cable from Bolivia into the United States and another one back to Brazil. Or if you want to do Brazil to, uh, to Costa Rica. Used to be you did satellite communications, but satellite communications have a quarter second delay. People don't like a quarter second delay when they're talking. There's a quarter second delay, the response is, oh, you're not speaking, I'll speak some more. That's the way we're programmed, that's the way we're built. So as soon as fiber optic cables became available, and they're much faster, communications started transiting the United States. The amount of transiting communications meant that sometimes a communication from Europe to Asia went through the United States. So it's not just that data centers were in the United States, but it's also where the fiber optic cables were built. Um, another thing that came out during the Snowden uh, disclosures was the spying on the EU, China, Brazil, and everyone else. Um, I have to say, that the Brazilians were spying on the US, the EU was spying on the Americans, China was, I mean, everybody spies on everybody. There was some pushback yesterday when I was talking about security. The fact is, everybody spies on everybody else. There are laws against spies in your own country, um, but people trade the spies when they capture them from somebody else. They don't always, but sometimes they do. It's an understood, although disliked, strongly disliked thing. Um, when I say everybody spies, uh, GCHQ, Britain, uh, was tapping, historically, communi many communications went through Britain. The, the remnants of the empire, the remnants of the commonwealth. Britain was tapping fiber optic cables for secret access to, to much of the world's communications. Sweden, in 2008, had approved a law allowing wiretapping without a warrant if one end is outside the United States. Now, I know we're in Asia, and maybe not everyone carries a map of Northern Europe in, in their head, but if you, if you had a map of Northern Europe in your head, you'd remember that, that Russia's on one side of, of Sweden, and that's the point for that law. That law enabled other allies to tap into communications going into Sweden, easily tap into. That is, the Swedes could do it, and then they could share the information with, with, its al with it, their allies. There was also very c close cooperation with the, the German um, intelligence agency. The fourth thing that the Snowden disclosures really revealed was attacks on secure communication systems, including cryptography standards. Now, I'm, I'm doing the Snowden disclosures in you know, seven minutes in a 45-minute talk, so I'm not going through everything in detail. But these are the big points. Of these, the first one was a secret interpretation of a U.S. law, which is, a, in, in my mind, in the view of many people, a secret law, which has no place in a democracy. Secret laws do not belong in democracies. They don't belong anywhere. But, the, but, uh, the, but democracies are founded on, on laws that are public. That one got changed in 2015. And now the data is held by the providers. Um, the other two, the second one had been known previously. It was a law that passed in 2008. Other countries might not have liked it, but it was public. Um, that one, the US backed off on tapping Merkel's phone. They didn't back off on many other things. The last one, I think, is actually a really severe problem. Um, <coughs> because when you have attacks on secure communication systems, including cryptographic standards, it weakens the security for everybody. Um, it's bad for security, it's bad for industry, and it's bad nationally and internationally. So we had 
we have the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which run open competition for developing cryptographic standards. And those standards, because they're openly arrived at, um, have been trusted by companies around the world and by nations around the world. Now, not everybody implements them. The Chinese, <coughs> for example, prefer to use their own standards. Um, but the, the Advanced Encryption Standard, which was adopted in, 20, in 2000, 2002, was, 2001, was widely used, is widely used around the world. What happened when I talk about attacks and secure communication systems, including cryptographic standards, is that the NSA did some efforts to undermine the, the public, certain standards and cert, rec, certain recommended cryptographic systems. And that had an impact first on NIST's reputation, but second on, on trust in, in, in the cryptographic and security standards. And I think that's very bad. Um, changes post Stoneden? Well, the first thing is that the public got pretty upset and began demanding secure devices and secure communications. Apple was already moving in that direction. The big change is secure by default. In 2012, you could get security technologies for your phone, but you had to be special. You had to work at it and so on. It's different when you open your phone and your phone automatically locks itself when you, you close and you can only open it by either your, your fingerprint or, or a pin code. Um, so the big change was iPhone security followed by Android security. Signal, which is an end-to-end -end encrypted system, communication system. WhatsApp, which I mentioned yesterday, uses the Signal technology, but it doesn't do the authentication quite the same way. So not recommended for somebody at high risk, like a human rights worker or a journalist, um, and so on. Um, because, but because it has traded convenience for security. But for the normal public, it's a great advantage. Um, the changes post Snowden, changes in US law and collection, some move to data localization. On the other hand, with each, encryption, with each terrorist attack, there are people who call for controls on encryption. It might be Amber Rudd, the British Home Secretary, it might be Macron. I know Europe and the US much better than I know Asia, so you can fill in your own places there. Uh, it's certainly been the FBI Director Comey. Um, there is a need to wiretap for both law enforcement and national security purposes, so how does one do it? Well, one solution was the CALEA solution, which said that all, uh, all digitally switched telephone networks have to be wiretap accessible, that is, wiretaps have to be built into, wiretap capability has to be built into the switches. IETF responded, no, 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 no. That just creates insecurities. Um, it creates complexity. And wherever you have complexity, you're going to have insecurity. And you need too many capabilities within the switch to enable wiretapping. Don't do it. Or don't put it in the standard. Um, <coughs> when previously, when you wiretapped, when you wiretapped at the phone company, somebody had to knock at the door of the phone company, say, here's the warrant. Examine the warrant. Now let us put the wiretap on. Or examine the warrant, put the wiretap on. Having a third party examine increases the security that things are being done properly. Also, the CALEA solution reduces, removes technical forms of minimization. There's the risk of exploitation and of overcollection. Has that happened? Vodafone Greece. Do you guys know about Vodafone Greece? No. Vodafone Greece. Vodafone, um, so Vodafone was buying its switches from Ericsson. Ericsson was complying with the ETSI, the European standards that, that were similar to the CALEA standards. Vodafone did not want, Vodafone Greece did not want capability to wiretap, so it, uh, did not, it did not get it in the switch. The switch got upgraded, wiretapping capability was put into the switch, but because Vodafone Greece had not paid for the wiretapping capability, auditing was not put alongside and the wiretapping was shut off. Except somebody went into the switch, whether remotely or at, at Vodafone Greece, we don't know, and turned the wiretapping cap on. Now you have wiretapping on, but no auditing, because the auditing hadn't been built into the switch. For 10 months in 2004, 2005, the 100 top members of the Greek government, including the prime minister, the head of the Ministry of Defense, uh, the Ministry of the Interior, and so on, the head of the, party, many, uh, of the opposition party, were wiretapped. It was discovered when a text message went awry, and then, and then um, it stopped. There's suspicions about who did it, but it's still not known, for sure. 
Um, Telecom Italia. Um, in a country of 60 million people, um, now let me try to remember the numbers, uh, 6,000 people were wiretapped these, without court order. These were judges, political people, uh, actresses and actors, peop referees, sports players. What did I just describe? I described people who can be uh, blackmailed. People who, with whom, if you listen into their conversations, they're public people and subject to much more blackmail than you or I. Um, we still don't know who did it. Law cases in, in Italy take a long time. Uh, Cisco developed an architecture for, to comply with Etsy. Some, and Cisco published it. Cisco did everything right. They published the architecture. Four years after they published it, somebody looked at it and said, where you say may include encryption should be must include encryption, because otherwise spoofing is possible, and somebody who isn't a law enforcement officer can actually conduct wiretaps. And then I talked to somebody from the NSA who told me in 2005, when they were looking at switches to be used by the US Department of Defense, every single CALEA compliant switch they looked at had a security problem in it, every single one. Pretty striking, this is 11 years after the law was passed. So when we talk about risks, we have to think about what law enforcement and national security uses to conduct surveillance. One thing they do is they have a law like CALEA, another thing they do is they hack in using vulnerabilities. But you probably all know that um, that CIA tools and NSA tools have been revealed on the network, have been revealed by WikiLeaks. WannaCry used hacks that were published as a result of that. That is, it relied on vulnerabilities that had been published. Uh, wiretapping in, an, in, a, in a, an encrypted world. FBI Director Comey, Home Secretary Amber Rudd, various other political people have asked for exceptional access. Allow encryption, but Law enforcement should have a way to get in. Well, the techies, which I consider myself one of, have written a number of papers explaining why if you build in a back door of any sort, and they don't like us to call it a back door, they don't want to call it a front door, they say it's exceptional access, they say it's golden key, but if you build in a way to get in, it creates risks. Um, I will mention a paper at the end. I'm going to go a few minutes over so you can shut that off because it's going to ding. Um, it also, exceptional access breaks what we call forward secrecy. Forward secrecy says each message uses a different encryption key. You don't set up an encryption key and use it forever because, or even for six months or two weeks, because if somebody has recorded all the communications, then if later on they figure out the key, they can break everything. But if you have a different key for each communication, it becomes exponentially harder. It also breaks authenticated encryption. One of the advances we've made over the last 40 years is we put, we do authentication. I, I authenticate myself, you authenticate yourself. We use, we, and we do encryption at the same time. The value of this is anytime you have a system that's more complex, first you do authentication and then you do encryption. Any system that's more complicated is more prone to failure. But exceptional access breaks both of those. So instead, there is the possibility of lawful hacking, using a vulnerability on the device. So a vulnerability on the device might enable somebody to go in and wiretap, if you have a mobile phone, for example, wiretap the phone. Or maybe all it does is it leaks the key. Okay? If it leaks the key, then you can wiretap elsewhere, do all the collection just like you usually would, but you have the key. Exceptional access is expensive, needs to be used rarely. It's been used by the FBI since at least 2003. In some sense, you can see this as different costs. If you have exceptional access, you weaken everybody's security. If you go to more fancy methods, like lawful hacking, you make it more expensive to conduct any single investigation, but you leave everybody more ever else more secure. How do attackers get in? Well, they get in through unpatched vulnerabilities, through stealing credentials. There's a wonderful talk at Usenix Enigma, Usenix Enigma from January 2016 by Rob Joyce, who, run, who at that time ran the tailored access operations at NSA. They're the people who break into systems. He said, I get a login credential. 
especially from a network administrator, I'm golden. I can go anywhere. So stealing credentials are the best way for somebody to break into systems. But of course, I've just described a conflict. I've said, let's go to encrypted communications, let's not backdoor them, but then when law enforcement wants to get into it, when law enforcement wants to get into a system, they should use, exception, uh, they should use lawful hacking. At the same time, if they don't report the vulnerabilities, then other people are prone to being attacked if someone else discovers the vulnerability, sells it on the black market, and so on. Um, we are in, a, I'm going to take an extra five minutes, we are in a remarkably changing world. Forty years ago, there were different switches and routers used all around the world. Now, there's a, now there, many of the systems are the same everywhere. That means if somebody in Tbilisi finds a vulnerability, they can use it not only in the Republic of Georgia, but they can use it in Beijing. They can use it in Hong Kong. They can use it in New York. Uh, and they can access Hong Kong, uh, Beijing, and New York. Search engines are able to, reach, uh, to reveal unpatched vulnerabilities. And as I said, you can access the, the vulnerability from anywhere. We're also in a remarkably changing world because there are many more communications devices and many more, much more data. We're all shedding data all the time, all the time, uh, which means there's an increased risk of surveillance. Um, making it easy to wiretap means more wiretapping, whether it's the bulk metadata collection or there was a case back right after 2001 where the FBI set up shop right next to the telephone companies to be able to get data quickly. At that time, the US didn't understand what kind of attack it was under. And so they had something called exigent letters, letters that just said, give me the data now. I'll get you more legal permissions later. But any time you slip up on the rules, you slip up on the rules. And there was a lack of specificity in the written request. The written request took a much longer scope of time, et cetera. Making it easy to wiretap means more wiretapping. It means threats by state actors against human rights workers, journalists, and research organizations. This can be by the state itself, uh, the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, or Mexico, or by another state, Russia against the US and France. Um, <coughs> what kind of electronic threats do we face? Terrorism, insider threats, cyber attacks, cyber exploit by enemies and by friends. Um, Cyber uh, economic espionage is not just by opponents, but also by one's allies. How much has the first one occurred? Very little. It's really the others. Um, I'm going to not talk about the threats from state actors, non-state actors, and, and, and insiders. The, the state actors I talked about yesterday the, began showing up in, in a big way in the 2000s. It was targeted at military information, then at the commercial sector. Attribution is difficult in real time. Figuring out who did it is difficult in real time. There are attacks against physical infrastructure and against civil society of late. Um, and there are also threats from one's own government. But let me end by talking about the threats we really face when we think about communications devices. Over the last few years, we've had Hurricane Sandy, which devastated New York and other parts of, of Northeast America. Uh, the Haitian earth earthquake killed 84, somewhere between 46 and 84,000 people. The Indian Ocean uh, earthquake and tsunami uh, killed 283,000. These are small numbers. If you go back in time, we're talking millions. And if you think about an opponent, when can an opponent be most disruptive? It's when you're in the middle of a crisis already. So I want to talk for just a moment about what first responders use. First responders are the term in, that we use in the United States to mean police, fire, um, ambulance, and so on. There, there are problems with wireline phones, whether it's an earthquake or a, uh, a, a flood. The wires often go out. There are problems with mobile phones. The cell towers go out. The electricity goes out. There are problems with satellite phones if you have clouds, if you have tall buildings, you have mountains in the way. What do they use? They use land mobile radio. What do, they, uh, what do they want when they use land mobile radio? 
They want interoperability, interoperability, interoperability. I don't know what it's like in this part of the world. In my part of the world, if you look at a police car, it has a whole bunch of antennas. It has to reach its own police department, its own fire, de fire department in its town, the ambulance in its town, and the police in the next town over, and the, and the fire in the next town over. And each of them is on a different signal. What they want more than anything is interoperability, and they want security. So when we talk about security, it's important in the whole picture of surveillance to think about what are, the pro what are the most serious problems and what are the problems we want to solve. So encryption, the pieces are securing devices and securing communications are somewhat different problems. I focus mostly on communications. Um, the threats have been about data theft. They are now moving with the, the Russia attacks to data manipulation and the threat actors are now nation states. And where are the real risks? And so I just want to tell you a little bit about my suggested readings. The first paper, uh, Keys Under Doormats, describes the kinds of threats when you have exceptional access, the kinds of vulnerabilities. The second paper talks about how you use lawful hacking to conduct wiretaps. The third is a report by the National Academies on what bulk signals intelligence collection. This is metadata collection. The Rob Joyce talk I mentioned. And then the last talk, paper, um, the Citizens Lab in Toronto has done an amazing job of looking at risks to human rights workers, uh, journalists, and so on, and what kinds of attacks they suffer from governments and so on. And it's worth reading, it's worth going to their site and, and reading papers. This one is the most recent one, the second most recent one, on attacks against a UAE human rights worker. So with that, I'll stop and we can do questions. <laughs>